really been looking forward to giving this talk today. This is an issue that is really important to me. So thank you to all of you for taking time out of your day to join us. So I'm just going to start off out of the gate by sharing with you the message that I hope to convey today, which is that the fight to protect biodiversity and the fight to address climate change are the same. We have to address climate change if we want to protect biodiversity, and we need biodiversity if we hope to mitigate and adapt to climate change. So just so we're on the same page, I define mitigation as actions that reduce the causes of climate change. So things that reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Adaptation are actions that address the consequences of climate change. So for example, building a seawall to deal with sea level rise. So today I hope to convince you that biodiversity and climate change are linked. And at the end, I'm also gonna talk about some actions that we can take to help and why I think that there is hope. So to start off with biodiversity, which is the variety of life on earth. Currently, um, there are just over 2 million described species on the planet. The actual number of species on the planet runs, um, estimates run up to 100 million. The most people think the actual numbers of species is somewhere between five and 10 million species. Those of you who are regulars at Xerces webinars know that most of those species are invertebrates. And in fact, insects make, over, make up over half of all the described species on the planet. Now, all of these, we share the earth with this amazing variety of species, but currently that biodiversity is at risk. And the IUCN Red List recently um, estimated that as many as one in four species is at risk of extinction in the near future. And that includes, for example, 40% of amphibians, 25% of mammals. You notice that insects aren't on this graphic. And that's because historically insects haven't received as much attention as other types of organisms, but that's been changing in the last few years. And in fact, many of us um, have noticed this big decline in insect abundance over our lifetime through something called the windshield effect. So I can remember riding in the car with my parents, driving through the country, and the windshield would be splattered with dead bugs. And that just doesn't happen anymore, right? So this is something we've seen over the course of our lifetimes. And now, in the past couple of years, there have been more and more scientific studies coming out documenting the same pattern using long-term data. This map is from a, a recent review paper. And basically, they wanted to catalog every study they could find showing insect declines using long-term data sets. So everywhere on this map where there's a little bar, that's a place where a study took place that found insect declines. So you can see that the taller bars indicate that there were many studies from those regions. So we can see that most of this research took place in Europe and the US, or at least um, there's some bias in, in where these studies are, are being published. Um, the other thing, but okay, so we have uh, many documented cases of insect declines in Europe and the US, but the factors that are causing these declines are operating globally. The other thing to notice about these graphs is that the bars are made up of, of many different colors. And each different color is a different insect order, so a different kind of insect. And what that tells us is that this pattern that we're seeing, it's not just beetles, for example, or butterflies, it's many types of insects are declining all around the world. Why is this happening? Well, these are the usual suspects. These are the factors that come up over and over again when we look into insect declines. So of course, habitat loss is a big one. Whenever we're talking about biodiversity loss of any group of organisms, habitat loss is a, a big player. It's difficult for species to persist if, if they have nowhere to live. When it comes to insect declines, widespread use of pesticides, especially insecticides are a really important factor. Invasive species, especially invasive plants that displace important host plants, pollen and nectar plants, for example, are, are really important here. Pollution and disease, changes in land use and land management are playing a role. 
and of course, climate change. And the role of climate change in contributing to these insect declines is becoming more and more apparent each year. So that's right. <laughs> One question that I often get asked is why should we care about insect declines? Why should we spend taxpayer dollars trying to prevent insects from going extinct? And I think that there are many reasons that we should care. I think there are moral reasons. I think that diversity has value in, in, in its own right. But I also think that if we just wanna look at it from a viewpoint of pure self-interest, what do we get out of it? And I would say that biodiversity is important because it provides us with ecosystem services. So ecosystem services are the supply of benefits from ecosystems to society that support human life and well-being. These are the things that make human life on this planet possible and even pleasant. So things like food production, pollination, which is responsible for so many of the foods we eat, water filtration by mussels and other invertebrates that clean our water, nutrient cycling by dung beetles and all of the creatures in our soil. If ecosystems stopped cycling nutrients, we would all go hungry very quickly. And of course, other things like cultural services, like the experience of visiting a monarch overwintering grove and seeing clusters of monarchs and trees. So there are many types of, of benefits that we get from having intact ecosystems on our planet. And these ecosystem services depend on biodiversity. So what we find over and over again is that biodiverse systems, so habitat with many species in it, are better at consistently providing us with ecosystem services over time than ecosystems with low biodiversity. So we, we have a more reliable supply of these ecosystem services when we have many species. One example of this is with pollination. So what we often find is that in agricultural systems, so in, in um, crops that are pollinated by, by bees, we get better crop production when we have many species of bees present compared to um, agricultural fields where we have only honeybees present. So having um, a diverse assemblage of pollinators um, benefits us in terms of the service of pollination. Ecosystem service that we hear a lot about when we are talking about climate change is carbon sequestration. So this is a natural process. Nature is really good at this. This is just the process by which plants soak up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere during photosynthesis, and they convert that carbon into tissues like wood or, or leaves and can store it for a long time. And especially when we're talking about trees and forests, they can store that carbon for, de for decades or longer. So forests are really important um, for um, climate change because of this carbon sequestration service. This is why deforestation contributes to climate change and why so many of the international agreements to address climate change often have goals around limiting deforestation. The forests are really good at this, but it's not just forests. There are many ecosystems that are providing the service of carbon sequestration, such as seagrass beds or mangroves. And yeah, so technically mangroves are forests, but a lot of people don't think of them when they think of forests. So I like to include them here. And grasslands, grasslands are really good at storing lots of carbon in their soils, even though uh, there's not a tree to be seen here. This is Kanza Prairie, which is tall grass prairie in Kansas and one of my favorite places. Another grassland, this is the Cedar Creek Research Station at, uh, in Minnesota. So the biologists here have been studying the effects of, of biodiversity on ecosystem services for decades. And with this experiment, you see the, the there's little patches of um, these little squares inside this, this study plot. And each one of the squares has a different number of plant species in it. And they have this army of technicians who go out and meticulously weed these patches to make sure each one has the right number of plant species. And what this experiment showed is that these grassland habitat that has many plant species is better at sequestering carbon than the patches with fewer species. 
So this gets back to what I talked about at the beginning of the talk, right? We need biodiversity to help us mitigate climate change. Having ecosystems with many species in them means those ecosystems are gonna be better at storing carbon and sequestering it than um, species or, or ecosystems with fewer species. Okay, so we talked about biodiversity declined. We talked about why it matters. We talked about these factors that are causing insect declines. Now we're gonna dig in a little bit deeper into climate change. So first off, um, I think it's worth stating that 98% of all climate scientists in the world agree that climate change is happening and that it's caused by human activities, specifically the burning of fossil fuels and deforestation. This photo here, this is Grinnell Glacier in Glacier National Park. This particular glacier has lost 45% of its mass over the last 50 years. And in fact, of the 37 named glaciers in Glacier National Park, only about 26 of them are still large enough to technically be considered glaciers. So we're seeing real-time impacts of climate change in one of our loveliest national parks. Now, when we talk about global warming, we often hear about, you know, one and a half degrees warming, we're gonna reach three degrees warming, how do we keep warming to two degrees? What does this all mean? So when we're talking about warming, we're talking about the average global temperature. So we're not talking about the local temperature, we're talking about the average everywhere on the planet, from Antarctica to the Sahara Desert. And then comparing that average temperature relative to temperatures prior to the Industrial Revolution, right? So average global temperatures have already increased one degree Celsius above those uh, pre-industrial temperatures. The Paris Agreement, um, the goal of that agreement is to hold warming to two degrees Celsius or less. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a report a couple years ago, really urging <laughs> us to aim for one and a half degrees Celsius and talking about how much less severe the effects will be if we can have that lower level of warming. Currently, we are on track to see warming of three to four degrees by the end of the century if we carry on as we are. And I know that that seems like a really small number, like three degrees Celsius, it's hard to wrap our minds around what that means. But as a point of comparison, the difference in average global temperature between an ice age and a warm period is only about four to six degrees Celsius. So we're looking at an equal magnitude of change, but instead of going from cold to warm, we're going from warm to hot. And the effects of <laughs> reaching three degrees Celsius would be catastrophic. And I don't use that word lightly. I think it would be catastrophic and it's something we should all be working very hard to prevent. And I think that, that, that we can. Okay, so what does this mean for um, climate in the US? Well, each region will vary slightly, but in general, temperatures will get warmer and heat waves will become more frequent, more intense, and they'll last longer. Precipitation changes will often include um, more drought and more flooding, and often flooding and drought will be more severe. A lot of times, um, the changes in precipitation are in the timing of rainfall events rather than the total amount of rainfall. So that has a lot of implications for agriculture. Extreme events will become more frequent and more intense. I think this is something we're all witnessing. There was the heat dome in the Pacific Northwest last year, we're hearing terms like polar vortex and heat domes and atmospheric rivers more frequently than we used to. Um, big storms are, are going to become more common. And then the oceans are also responding to climate change. And these are the effects that usually keep me up at night. Um, ocean acidification will be a problem and sea levels will continue to rise. And just as an example, if all of the ice, on Greenland were to melt, then 80 of the world's 100 largest cities would flood. So I think that anyone who argues that we shouldn't address climate change because it's too expensive simply doesn't understand the situation that we're in. Um, because I think what would really be too expensive is not addressing this. Now the good news is that we have a choice. 
the severity of these effects of climate change are directly related to the amount of warming we allow, which depends on how much, how much fossil fuels we continue to burn. So if we choose to hold warming to one and a half degrees Celsius, these effects will be much less severe than we if we choose to let warming go to two degrees Celsius, and that will be less severe than three degrees Celsius and so on. So we have, we have a choice. Now, what do these effects of climate change mean for insects, such as pollinators? Let's look at a few of the ways that climate change can affect pollinators. There are many, there are many ways that this can happen, but these are just a few. So temperature is really important to the biology of insects like pollinators. It can affect things like how fast they grow, how big they are when they're adults, when they can be active during the day, how quickly they digest their food and how many nutrients they get from that food. All of these things are affected by temperature. And when temperature increases a little bit, that can often be beneficial. But if it gets too hot so that the animal gets near the, um, the top of the range of what they can um, handle, then that can have negative effects. Think of how when people get too hot, they suffer heat stress or heat stroke. So an analogous thing could happen. So if it gets too hot, or if we get a lot of intense heat waves, that could have negative effects on, on, on animals. Phenology is a fancy word to describe the timing of biological events. So the timing of when a particular species of plant flowers in the spring. With pollinators, the concern is that they, we could get a mismatch in the phenology of pollinators and the plants that they rely on. For example, if pollinators are emerging in the spring in response to temperature and the plants are responding to um, day length, you could get a mismatch. Um, the other, another commonly discussed effect of climate change is rain shifts. Species may be expected to shift their distribution to track the, the climate they're, they're adapted to. In general, species are expected to move to higher altitudes and higher latitudes, though not all species will, will change their range. So here in North America, what that means is that some species might be expected to move to higher elevations and further north. This, of course, requires habitat for species to move to and habitat for species to move through in order for this to happen. And of course, species that are already you know, living at high elevations or high latitudes have nowhere to move to. And then plants are also responding to climate change, and that can affect um, pollinators through changes in plant quality or quantity or diversity. For example, if drought becomes more common, that means there's going to be fewer flowers on the landscape. Now I talked about all of these causes of insect decline and I've got this figure with each of these factors independently affecting insect decline, but actually these factors are also interacting with each other. And this is another problem is that these different um, stressors could interact with each other and sort of magnify negative effects of, of climate change on insects. So for example, you could imagine maybe exposure to a really low level of pesticide isn't harmful to a, a bee during normal conditions, but maybe during a drought or a heat wave when the animal is already stressed out, exposure to that same level of pesticide might become lethal. So we have to worry about um, interactions among these factors. So we've talked about how climate change can affect insects. How does that um, influence biodiversity loss? Here's one example with bumblebees. And um, basically, they looked at bumblebee communities in Europe and the US, and they divided the landscape up into these little grid cells that you can see in the map. And then they asked, what was the temperature, baseline temperature like in each of these cells? So they looked at the temperatures between 1901 and 1974, each of these cells, and they asked, you know, what was the temperature like? How hot did it get? And then they compared that to current temperatures. So in each of these cells, they looked at temperatures between 2000 and 2015. And then they compared the baseline to the current temperature. And what they found was that bumblebee declines were happening in areas where the current temperatures were higher than the maximum baseline temperatures. So another way to say that is that bumblebees were most likely to decline in areas where current temperatures were often hotter than they had experienced historically in those locations. 
And this takes us back to what I said at the beginning of the talk, which is that we have to address climate change if we want to protect biodiversity because it is affecting um, species. Here's a different example, but with butterflies. So this was just published last year and they used three long-term data sets to look at the abundances of butterflies in the Western US. And what they found was that Western butterflies have declined in abundance at a rate of 1.6% per year over the last 40 years. So 1.6% isn't that bad, but when you can pound it over 40 years, that's a huge decline in insect abundance. And what they found with their study is that these declines were most strongly linked to increases in fall temperatures. So here again, we see the fingerprints of climate change when we look into insect declines. And again, we have to address climate change if we want to protect biodiversity. And there have been many studies coming out more and more showing how climate change can cause biodiversity loss. And some studies show that at really high rates of warming, we even could risk losing whole suites of species in very short periods of time. What these studies often tell us, um, one consistent theme is that the magnitude of biodiversity loss increases with the magnitude of warming. So if we act decisively to reduce carbon emissions, we can reduce biodiversity loss. We have a choice, right? If we allow warming, at two degrees, we're gonna lose more species than if we hold warming to one and a half degrees and so on. But we have to address climate change if we want to protect biodiversity. So how do we do that? <laughs> we can help. I think that there are a lot of things that we can do to address climate change and biodiversity loss. And at Xerces, this is sort of our, our philosophy for how we go about that. So first we have to restore and protect habitat. Again, if species can't persist if they don't have anywhere to live. And in general, the more habitat a species has, the larger its populations can be. And then in general, that will mean they're less vulnerable to extinction than a smaller population. We also need to increase habitat connectivity. That's important um, also for reducing extinction risk. And we need to reduce additional stressors. So those other drivers of insect loss that I talked about that can interact with each other and magnify the negative impacts of climate change on, on species. And then of course we have to directly cap, tackle climate change and, and um, reduce our carbon emissions. We'll talk about these first three steps here first, which all fall under the umbrella of nature-based climate solutions. So nature-based climate solutions are basically actions that take advantage of the natural ability of ecosystems to sequester carbon by protecting and restoring natural habitat, especially healthy biodiverse habitat. If we do this, that could contribute up to 20% of the climate mitigation needs that we need to keep warming to two degrees Celsius. And 20% is a big chunk. Like we're in an all hands on deck moment. And so this is a significant contribution towards reaching that goal. And it also has the benefits of protecting biodiversity and providing other ecosystem services. And again, those biodiverse systems are going to be better at sequestering carbon, helping us to mitigate climate change. And there's good news on this front. So for example, here in California, where I live, the governor signed um, the 30 by 30 initiative, which is basically directing the state to protect 30% of its land by 2030 as part of the state's strategy to address climate change. At Xerces, we work with a variety of partners to create and restore habitat for pollinators. And this is our way of contributing to these nature-based climate solutions. We create habitat like this hedgerow along an almond orchard in the Central Valley. These habitats increase biodiversity of the plants, but also the insect community and, uh, and other wildlife that use it. We use climate smart plants in these plantings. So here in California, that means plants that can withstand a lot of drought, like this California fuchsia and the gumweed in the picture. This habitat increases connectivity, which again makes um, species a little bit more resilient to extinction risk. And of course, these plantings also provide carbon sequestration benefits. 
Another example of the work we're doing is some work I'm doing with my coworker, Jennifer Hopwood, where we're creating guidance for departments of transportation who want to create pollinator habitat along roadsides. And one of the recommendations that we keep coming back to over and over again is biodiversity. And at Xerces, we're always trying to build as much biodiversity as we can into our habitat work. So having many species means you can support lots of pollinators, but there are other benefits. If you remember, I said that there are some parts of the country that are going to get both more drought and more flooding. It's really hard to find a plant species that can tolerate both of those conditions. But if you have many plant species in your planting, you're likely to have some species that will do well when it's flooding and some species that do well when it's a drought, which means that that planting will persist over time. It will continue to provide the carbon sequestration benefits that you want, the erosion control benefits you want, the other benefits that you're looking for, while also continuing to provide food for pollinators we want to support in these plantings. So we're supporting biodiversity at the same time. Um, again, <laughs> biodiversity will help us adapt to climate change. All contribute to nature-based climate solutions and support pollinator biodiversity in our communities by creating pollinator habitat. And it doesn't have to be big. It could be a container garden on your balcony. It could be a flower bed in your yard. And I think that once we start looking beyond our residences, see that there are many opportunities to create habitat in the places where we live. And some key components of that, of that habitat that contributes to these nature-based climate solutions are um, habitat that uses many plant species and especially um, woody shrubs and trees, and then protecting that habitat from pesticides. Again, we wanna minimize those additional stressors. This is my backyard. You see, it's tiny. It's a little yard. I'm super grateful for it. Uh, we've only been here a couple of years, so this is, this is my garden at two years old. Um, and even though it's small, I've seen all sorts of cool pollinators and bees. I had bumblebees, I had butterflies, including monarchs. And two years in, I had a black phoebe feeding in my yard, which was a big day for me, big day because black phoebes are insectivores. They don't come to feeders, they only eat insects. And what that told me was that my yard was finally growing enough insects that it was worthwhile for this bird to come on in and look for lunch. And this is the goal, right? To, to create these habitat patches that support biodiversity. And one of the reasons my tiny yard is able to support so much biodiversity is because it's not just my yard. There's lots of habitat in my neighborhood. There are people taking out their lawns and planting gardens, maybe because they want to save on their water bill, or maybe someone plants a pollinator-friendly plant in their yard because they see it in a neighbor's house and they think it's pretty. So a lot of people are contributing to, to this. And I guess the point, <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is that what we do matters. And even if it feels like an action that we're taking is small, it can still have a bigger impact than we expect because first of all, our actions can inspire others to join in and our actions combine with the actions that other people are taking and, and snowball into something really meaningful. And so in my neighborhood, that means supporting biodiversity. So I think this is really important. And then of course, as we're all planting these plants, we're um, contributing to carbon sequestration in our neighborhood, especially when we're planting woody shrubs and trees. And I'd like to talk about trees for a minute because it's something we hear a lot about in response to climate change is that, oh, we should plant trees, plant lots of trees. And that's great, I think we should plant trees, but there is not often a lot of discussion about what types of trees to plant. So let's look at the benefits of planting something like a native oak tree versus a non-native ornamental like a crepe myrtle, which are beautiful trees. When, when I lived in Houston, we had some of these in the yard of the house that I rented and they are lovely. lovely. All right, both trees are providing carbon sequestration benefits, right? They're both like sponges soaking up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, storing it for a long time. Both trees help with the urban heat island effect. 
So this is a phenomenon where cities and towns are much hotter than the surrounding landscape because of all the asphalt and concrete. And I think anyone who stood on hot sidewalk and shifted in bare feet and jumped over to the grass because it was too hot can kind of understand why and how this works, right? Well, if we have a thick tree canopy, a nice urban forest, that helps reduce this urban heat island effect, especially during heat waves. So having a healthy tree canopy is really important um, for carbon sequestration, but also for helping us adapt to those um, heat waves that are coming with climate change. And so I think this is important, and especially those um, efforts to plant trees in underserved parts of our, our cities and towns that have historically been neglected when it comes to tree planting or creating um, green spaces. So there's an important environmental justice component here. So, so far so good. Both of these trees are performing. It's when we look at supporting biodiversity that we see a difference. So in North America, there are approximately 900 species of, of butterflies and moths that use oak trees as host plants. So a host plant is the plant that the caterpillars have to feed on to mature into an adult. So if you're planting an oak, you're supporting potentially hundreds of species of butterflies and moths, depending on where you live, but you're also supporting all the birds and other animals that rely on those caterpillars for food. There are zero species of butterflies and moths in North America that use crepe myrtles as host plants. And that's just because crepe myrtles didn't evolve here. So the, the butterflies and moths that did haven't had time to adapt to using this tree as a host plant because plants have all sorts of nasty chemicals in them to prevent <laughs> insects from eating them. So while both types of trees are providing the climate services we're interested in, native trees are able to support biodiversity in a way that some ornamental trees are not. And this is why I think it's so important that we really recognize that biodiversity and climate change are linked so that we can look at our strategies for addressing climate change and we can ask, okay, this is how we're gonna deal with climate change. Can we make any modifications or just adjust those, those um, recommendations a little bit so that we're addressing climate change, but also supporting biodiversity? Because that's a win-win. And if we're not doing that, then I think we're missing important opportunities. And we're in a position where <laughs> I think we have to take advantage of every opportunity possible. All right, so the next thing we need to do is, is take direct action on climate change. And the first thing I think we have to acknowledge is that there is hope. Um, this is Dr. Michael Mann. He's a prominent climate scientist and he wrote this book called The New Climate War. And he describes how the people and organizations that have devoted so many resources to discrediting the science behind climate change have shifted to trying to create despair. They want us to believe that it's hopeless, that nothing we do matters, that it's too late anyway, there's nothing to do but just brace for impact. Because if we believe that, then we won't act, right? And then they win, which is not acceptable. So we have to, <laughs> we, we can't give in to despair, but the good news is, is that we don't need to despair because there is hope. Um, there's a lot of movement happening on climate change. We just need to get it happening a little bit faster and, and more broadly. And actually, we already have the technology that we need to meet 80% of the global energy demands by 2030 and 100% by 2050. So it is still possible to hold warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius or 2 degrees Celsius. The window is closing fast, but it's still possible. Uh, we can do this through a combination of clean energy and increased energy efficiency. So some of that is using less energy, but some of it is things like smart grids and battery technology. But the point is that it's possible. We just have to implement these practices quickly and broadly. And for that, we need political will. And that's, that's the trick, right? How do we do that? Well, these are some things that I think can make a difference. So voting is important. Uh, we have to vote in every single election at all levels of government. So everything from city to <laughs> federal. 
And we need to insist that our representatives are aggressively taking action on climate change. We don't want lip service or greenwashing. We need real solutions that are equal to the scale of the problem. And politicians who are unable or unwilling to do that need to be voted out. And I realize that that's easier said than done, especially with so many states trying to make it harder for people to vote. But I think it's still, this is a first step, it's so important. Other things we can do are talking about climate change and taking individual action, which I'll talk about next. So this is Dr. Katherine Hayhoe. She's another prominent uh, climate scientist. And she wrote this book called Saving Us. And her, the thesis, the, the central idea of this book is that the, one of the best ways we can help with climate change is just to talk about it. Because so many people care about climate change, but they don't talk about it. And so they feel like they're the only ones who care. Um, so talking about it with more people can inspire people to take action and maybe also convince people who are on the fence or maybe just don't recognize the urgency of the situation. So her strategy is to find someone that you have a connection with. And it could be something simple, like you live in the same place or your kids go to the same school. Or maybe you enjoy, you both enjoy something like fishing or winter sports, or you both care about um, fighting poverty. Find a connection and then talk about why climate change matters to you and how it affects this thing that you care about, this thing that you have in common. And then talk about how much we have to gain by acting on climate change. Because most people mistakenly believe that even though it might be important to act on climate change, Individually, it will mean um, negative, it will have negative consequences on us personally, which isn't true. We have so much to gain, cleaner air, cleaner water, cheaper energy, more jobs, as well as the benefits to these things that maybe you're passionate about, like um, skiing in the winter. So talking about it can, can bring more people on board because we do need everyone to come together to start pressuring um, our leaders to act. This comic is by Rosemary Moscow, and I think it nicely encapsulates some of the reasons um, that Catherine Hayhoe talks about taking action. And if you um, talk about climate change and you want to move to more action, you could join some of these, the many groups that are out there that are um, working to take action on climate change. And these are just a few examples. There's the Citizens Climate Lobby and 350.org, both have hundreds of chapters all over the world. Third Act is um, an organization started by Bill McKibben, who's with 350.org, and it's just for retirees. And the idea is to take advantage of the experience and expertise and connections the retired people have and channel it towards addressing climate change. Of course, there are all sorts of other groups that focus on climate change as part of a suite of issues that they can care about. One example that I find personally inspiring is the Poor People's Campaign. So find a group that um, inspires you or that you feel a connection to and see how you can um, contribute. And I think it's worth pointing out that you don't have to be perfect to join these organizations or to talk about climate change. You don't have to be an expert on climate change and you don't have to be a person with like a teeny tiny next to zero carbon footprint in order to join in. You just have to be someone who cares. And finally, I think we need to take what steps we can. And while ultimately we have to transition to clean energy and that requires some top-down um, regulation and incentives from our government, I do think that taking individual action is important. And so things you could do would be something like calling your representatives and I understand that calling representatives can be um, more effective than, than signing petitions, for example, but talk to them about why climate change, why action on climate change matters to you. I think the divestment movement has been really good. Um, this started on college campuses with students asking their colleges to divest from fossil fuels. And this has been a growing movement. Maybe you could talk to your coworkers about asking your employer to divest from fossil fuels or talk to your city council. As I said, it's important that we have political leaders who are um, dedicated to making 
action on climate change. So maybe you could help get the vote out by registering voters or driving people to the polls or being a poll worker or something like that in order to um, make sure that everyone who's eligible to vote can. And then of course there are lifestyle changes you could take to reduce energy uses. Um, washing your laundry in cold water, carpooling or taking public transportation if that's available where you live, reducing food waste. You could plant a pollinator garden that includes some, some shrubs or trees to um, contribute to nature-based climate solutions. In Catherine Hoy Hayhoe's book, she talks about how every year she makes two small changes to her lifestyle to reduce her carbon footprint. So maybe this year with um, Earth Day just two weeks away, we could all follow her example and make one or two small changes. It doesn't have to be big, it can be a small start. Um, it could be something like just committing to talk about climate change more, or maybe once a month you call one of your representatives to talk about climate change, or once a month you call the manufacturer of a product that you buy and ask that company how they're addressing climate change and that you want to support companies that are taking aggressive action. I think it's important to start to, to do something. It makes us feel empowered and hopeful, and it also encourages other people to join in. And I think, as I said, we our window for action to prevent the most severe effects of climate change is closing fast, but we have to build a movement and make sure that our leaders are, are, are putting legislation forward and that individuals and companies are acting to, to reduce climate change as much as possible. Because I think that we have so much to gain by acting now um, and a lot to lose by, by if we don't. Okay, that's all I have today. So I'd like to thank you all again for taking time to be here today. And of course, I want to thank all of our wonderful members who make our work at Xerces possible. So thank you and I'll take questions. Thank you, Angela. You're getting um, quite a few just comments and just thanks for the presentation and for actual actions that people can take. I think climate change is such a big monster of an issue. It's hard to know what to do, um, but thank you for that. So we do have a few questions. One is a clarifying question. If you could just explain what habitat connectivity means. So connectivity is when habitat is close together that animals can move from patch to patch. So for example, if, if you have um, a bunch of pollinator gardens in a neighborhood could be highly connected with that animals can easily move from patch to patch. So connectivity it kind of varies depending on the species that you're talking about, but basically it just means um, that it's easy for an animal to move from one patch to another. Thank you. This one woman has a question. Um, it's probably a difficult one to answer, but they sometimes feel like they're speaking, preaching to the choir, but how do they reach folks that really don't, I guess, believe is a hard word to say, but believe in climate change, really kind of see that it's happening and understand our, our impact and their town and their providence um, currently, or burnt down last year and still trying to point out why maybe that happened. Do you have any suggestions on really how to talk to people that may, um, just completely not understand or really want to hear. I think that's kind of the crowd <laughs> we're always trying to reach. It's any it's, any feedback or comments. <laughs> it's tough. I think it is tough. And Catherine Hayhoe's book was excellent. So I definitely recommend that to anyone who wants to dig a little bit deeper. I think what she says makes sense. There's some people who we can never convince, but there are a lot of people who are open to um, different arguments. And I think the key is just finding that, that thing that you have in common and being open and respectful and um, trying to talk about how climate change affects that thing that you care about and how much we have to, how addressing climate change will benefit this connection. And it, I feel like it's not something where one, <laughs> One conversation is going to change minds, but maybe over time um, to the things that they care about helps. And so Catherine has a lot of great examples in her book. Um, for example, talking to 
I think it was a Rotary Club, they have like this, this four step process for deciding if something is, is worthwhile. And so she uses, she used that process to talk about climate change. And so if there's a way you can get in by talking about something that they care about and, and approaching it from like, we're on the same team as opposed to you're all wrong and you're bad because you're doing this, this, and this, I think that that can help. It's, it's hard, it's tough. I wish I had a good answer. It is really hard. Well, I think you have really good suggestions, though, <laughs> place to start. <laughs> her, book, her book was really easy read and enjoyable, so um, it, it, many of you might enjoy it. This next question is kind of in the same line, um, but more specific. How do you address the argument that fossil fuels are cheap to use and an economic necessity? So they're not cheap when we actually include all the costs. We pay billions of dollars in subsidies to fossil fuel industry every year through, through tax, um, um, through uh, reduced taxes that we charge them, through um, giving them really cheap land leases, but also through the costs that they don't have to pay for, such as the damage done through extreme events caused by climate change, but also pollution, um, asthma, all of these problems that we get from fossil fuels, we pay for it, even if we don't pay for it, like when we're pumping gas at our car. We stopped all of those subsidies that our tax dollars are going to, to these companies that are making millions of um, dollars every quarter um, and put that into the development of clean energy. I think that would go a long way, but there's also, so there's a report, I think it's called the 2035 report um, that was put out by um, a policy center at the University of Berkeley, but they show how transitioning to clean energy will actually be cheaper at, than um, fossil fuel energy. And another, I mean, another cost, right, is this war <laughs> that's happening between Russia and um, Ukraine. If we are able to wean ourselves off fossil fuels, that means that people like Putin have less power. And so there are different ways that we pay for climate, for fossil fuels that are not reflected in our bank statement, but we still pay for them. Maybe we pay for them at the doctor's office or in other ways, but fossil fuels aren't cheap. And there are studies saying that our actual, our, our bank bills though for, for energy would be lower if we're able to transition to clean energy. That was a great answer. <laughs> I'm learning so much. This is, this is great. Someone is asking about, um, they loved your statistic about how nature-based climate solutions can, could contribute 20% of the mitigation need to keep warming to two degrees Celsius. Do you have um, the source available for that? I do. I can send it to you and you could maybe, can you email it to everyone? I have to look it up, but there's been a couple papers. Um, the Nature Conservancy has been involved in some of this research, um, but there have been a couple papers out. I can, I can send that to Rachel to distribute. Person or you can email me. You can email me, Angela.laws at Xerces.org, and I can just send it to you directly. Okay, perfect. I'll put your email address in the, in the chat in a minute here. Thanks. There are a few questions specifically about what types of trees people should be planting. I didn't know if you wanted to share any sources for that. So in general, a native tree is going to support more pollinators than a non-native tree, just because the insects and plants have evolved together. And so more insects have overcome the defenses of that tree to use it. Oaks are the powerhouse. Um, but in general, if you're planting willows or oaks or uh, maples, uh, prunus uh, species, so black cherry and things like that are, are really good. Things that are lovely <laughs> ornamental trees but didn't evolve here generally are going to be host to fewer things. So it's something like crepe myrtle or ginkgos. Um, things like that generally are not going to support as many um, pollinators. And the same thing with woody shrubs. Woody shrubs are really good at sequestering carbon because of the wood. They live longer, so they store the carbon longer. Um, if you plant flowering shrubs, you get this carbon sequestration benefits, but you're also benefiting pollinators and other wildlife. Something specific to kind of um, going in the lines of recommendations. Someone had a question about heat domes and during heat domes, 
would species benefit from operating a mister, like a water mister? Um, some species might. I think that, yeah, cooling down temperatures could help. And it's hard to say, like, different species are going to have that a different thermal tolerance limit. Some species can only take it this hot, and some species can deal with much hotter temperatures. But in general, I think um, that could help. Certainly the birds will, will enjoy it. <laughs> Someone was saying how much they enjoyed seeing the pictures of your yard and they were very inspired by the quick response of pollinators and the mutual yeah. interest and values in your neighborhood. Do you think that your neighbors have decided to also plant pollinator gardens and do you think they know that you are helping to fight climate change? So I think I have had a few people walk by I haven't decided what to do with my front yard yet, but on the side between my um, my driveway and my neighbor's driveway, I have planted all native plants. I've got a pollinator garden sign. And I have had a few people ask me about milkweed and other plants. Um, and I think that, so in California, we have a lot of drought and Sacramento has a program where the city will pay you to take out your lawn. So I think a lot of people are converting their lawn to um, pollinator friendly plantings just not because they care about pollinators, but because they don't want to spend money on their water bill. And I think some people might just say, oh, that's pretty, I want that in my yard. So I think there might be a lot of people planting pollinator habitat, even though they don't know that that's what they're doing. <laughs> but then there are people who are, and I think it's, I think it spreads. And especially with, with front yards, I think there's a lot of pressure. Like you feel pressure to have a pristine <laughs> American yard, right? Like lawn those shrubs that don't provide any habitat value and it's a biological desert, but it's hard to change that. And so I think the more you start doing that, other people will catch on and be like, okay, it's okay not to have this perfectly manicured sterile yard in my front yard because my neighbor's doing it and people haven't been like egging their house <laughs> or whatever, right? So I think, I think just seeing that change influences other people to do similar things. They see it and they like it and they say, oh, it's okay to do this. And, and so I do think our effects, our actions have ripple effects in that way. Definitely. We also have habitat signs through Xerxes. You can also make your own. I think it's great when people are walking around and they see that, that sign and they, they think twice about, you know, it's more than just having a pretty front yard or maybe really messy front yard for some <laughs> folks. Yeah. But knowing that it's <laughs> pollinator habitat. Yeah. Would you look we do have a question about warming temperatures and how are they affecting the Western butterfly specifically? The um, warmer fall temperatures. Right, right, with that long-term study. So they, they don't know the exact mechanism, but some hypotheses are that it's warmer. And so the butterflies are maybe living longer, but the plants are senescing sooner. So there could be a mismatch between the plants that are available in the fall. Um, that's one idea, but there, it's something that needs a lot more, more research, but just another example of how we're seeing these changes in temperatures can have impacts on, on species, um, you know, across the board, like many different species responding in this way. Mm -hmm. Just reading through the questions, we have time for a couple more here. This person who read that large old growth forests should be left alone instead of being cut down because those forests help tremendously with carbon sequestration. Is this the case? Yes, I think so. And a part of the issue with deforestation, especially, especially in tropical areas, is when you remove the forest, it, um, it changes the habitat. And so it's really difficult to to restore that habitat, um, you know, replacing it with like a weedy field or a grassland, it doesn't, it's not going to sequester as much carbon as it did. Um, so I think in keeping forests intact where we are, and I realize that, you know, there are also economic issues at play and there's the social justice component of this is really important, but I think that wherever we can protect forests, we should. All right, switching gears here a little bit. Someone's just asking if you can repeat the name of the action group for retirees. 
Um, third act. Perfect. I'm going to check that it's not second act. <laughs> 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 yep, third act. We have another woman asking. She's actually tabling at a pollinator walk slash run, which sounds really fun, by the way. Yeah. And wondering if um, they could use any of your charts for the table. Maybe they could email you to get some of those. Sure. And I did put Angela's email in the chat, so hopefully everyone can see that. We do have another question um, asking if you could just repeat the title of the book that you've mentioned a few times and the author's name. So one is The New Climate War by Michael Mann. And the other one is Saving Us by Catherine Hayhoe. Um, or I'll write it in the uh, Saving Us. I feel like after the last, what, six years or so, I need <laughs> I needed to hear something positive because I, I certainly have my moments of despair um, and we just can't, we don't have the luxury of giving mm -hmm. up. And so reading these books was, was nice. And I think that it did make me feel more hopeful. Um, I mean, we have a long way to go. We have a, a hard fight ahead of us, but um, I think more people care about climate change than we realize just because we don't often talk about it. Um, it's one of those things that we kind of, we don't want to upset people or be confrontational, which I get. Um, so we don't talk about it. Um, and so I think that if we, if we do that more, we could maybe make a difference. Definitely. Yeah. I think we all feel that at Xerxes. I mean, if there's nothing that we could do, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> and so we're all trying to yeah, find hope in the work. And it's just such a community um, solution. And it's really inspiring to be on webinars like this and see so many passionate people wanting to do big and small things um, to help. Right. So we'll end on this last question. They, um, this person specifically asking about maintaining lawns, but what to add to the lawn to support insects. They have clover down. Um, do you have any resources or recommendations for folks? That's great. Um... You can check out our Pollinator Conservation Resource Center. There are, especially for like the Midwest, I know there are some recommendations about bee lawns. So having um, more of a meadow in your, in your lawn can help support more species than just having turf grass. So that's definitely um, one way to go. And I think um, our staff member in Minnesota was saying that the they passed some legislation to help um, cost share with people who, or, or there's some program being started to help people pay to install these um, bee lawns. So I would say check out our website. There's not a lot of that happening here in California just because water is scarce, but in parts of the Midwest and other parts of the country, that is something. So let's say look into the Pollinator Conservation Resource Center for your region on our website. 